let's move on to Bangladesh now. And Mushfiq Mubarak uh, will give us his uh, presentation um, um, on what's been happening in Bangladesh. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll I'll just you know try to keep my uh, presentation uh, short. I'll use just uh, uh, two slides to give just an overview of the talk. I'll just give an overview of the various things that we're that we're doing, and and I hope that with, through the Q and A we can delve into some of the details. So let me share my screen. Uh, You know what? Uh, this might be better. Okay. Um, so, uh, is is my audio and video okay? Just show me a thumbs up if it is. Or right, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Mushfiq. Okay. Everyone can hear Mushfiq. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, that should be fine now. Um, Okay, so here's uh, so we're uh, so overall we're working in close collaboration now uh, with the government of Bangladesh and in particular A2I, which is kind of the technocratic unit within the government, uh, with BRAC and now also with the various uh, uh, major telecom providers, in order to try and devise an evidence-based policy response. And so let me just walk through the various uh, categories of that of that response. Um, these are just some of the few things we're we're doing, and uh, there's actually a lot more that I couldn't fit on the slide. And uh, so uh, and and of course this was uh, this was this is done in collaboration with uh, now at least you know 25 30 different uh, researchers. And then we have for data collection, like 300 enumerators on staff with phone survey, you know, phone survey material, tablets, et cetera. And then we have about 50, 60 volunteer young professionals in Bangladesh who are also volunteering their time to, uh, uh, to make, make this all work very quickly. Uh, the virus moves quickly and we need it to move very fast. And so I'm just representing the, the work of a very large group uh, and too many to name individually. Okay, so when we started thinking about the problem as the disease arrives, this is about two and a half weeks ago. Um, so the first, um, the first thing I realized is that, look, we're not going to have testing data uh, in the immediate term, not even in the medium term, especially in rural Bangladesh. Right? So we can't rely on that form of uh, data collection to, to be able to get a handle of uh, like how, how the disease is spreading and what the, what the emerging risks are. And so for the past uh, few years, I've been um, collecting uh, data in Bangladesh for independent reasons on a lot of different projects. And so I noticed that there's an opportunity here, which is that you know we have a lot of idle staff capacity, right? We, we stopped all in-person um, activities. And so they were, that's why they were idle. We had the infrastructure in place to rapidly start collecting data. So we started using convenient samples. So let me just show you. So this is, these are the, um, uh, areas of Bangladesh where we had these existing surveys running. Um, these are the various unions uh, around the country. It, it ends up covering, it's over-representing the areas that are more populated, like Dhaka, Chittagong Division, Mormonjing Division. Uh, so it maybe represents like 60% or 60-70% of the country. And it, it was convenient because these are samples that already had some level of statistical representativeness to it or or you know, we understood the properties or the adjustments we'd need to make in order to say representative things. Right? Um, and it's also convenient because we have a ton of baseline information on these people. Right? And so now what we ended up doing was starting two weeks ago, we immediately started making, um, making phone calls um, and we started asking, that's what I have um, here. So first we uh, collaborated with the Yale Institute of Global Health with um, you know, Bangladesh, uh, like a medical association in North America, so Bangladeshi doctors um, practicing here, as well as Bangladeshi doctors in, in Bangladesh who we got uh, uh, advice from, and tried to figure out, okay, if you only had the luxury of doing phone surveys, how can we uh, ask about symptoms, both positive symptoms that predict COVID as well as negative symptoms that like, like ear pain or nasal congestion that don't, because those are uh, more uh, reflective of, say, pneumonia or common cold, right? 
to develop an algorithm that Yale was using anyway uh, in the absence of testing uh, in the United States uh, to, to kind of get a, make a statistical inference about the likelihood of COVID in the community. So there's these medical questions. It's, it's also important for us to track health behaviors and knowledge and how that's changing um, to things like, are they practicing social distancing? And um, uh, are they wearing masks uh, when they're going out, right? Um, th things like that, and people, are, do people know about all of this uh, and are they changing behaviors? Okay. Now, beyond all the medical public health stuff, like the other dimension of this crisis that's emerging, we already have the data, unfortunately, is that um, this can lead to food insecurity. You know, there's been huge drops in people's earnings capacities in the last two weeks. Um, so I'm also, I'll tell you some numbers. Um, so I've also started collecting this data in Nepal. So a lot of what I'm describing in Bangladesh, some of it we're, we're starting to do in Nepal and in Sierra Leone as well. Those are other, other places where, where, I, where I do research. And we, we had the advantage of similar uh, samples. And what, what you find is, you know, in, as in many uh, rural areas of agrarian areas of South Asia, there's some seasonal variation in, uh, in labor demand and wage earnings. So there are these pre-harvest lean periods, right? So in Nepal, we had, uh, you know what? I wish I could, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna try and pull up and show you, show you a graph. Uh, so, so we have some seasonal variation in, uh, uh, in, in, in labor demand and even relative to the lean period, right? The, uh, uh, the, the labor demand and, 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 and labor use and wage earnings have fallen. Oh, here's, here's a graph, uh, it's easiest to find it on Twitter. Uh, so this, these, this is a sample that we are following around in Nepal. So in September, October, November, December, January of, of this year, right? And so this is the variation that you see in labor hours. And here's what happens immediately after the lockdown. There's a 50% drop in, um, in, in time spent at work, 70% drop in, in uh, like sort of wage earning labor hours or self-employment uh, hours. The reason it's uh, only 50 for overall is that when people don't have work, they switch some of their time to spending it on, uh, on their own farm. Okay, so, so we have to track all of this. So what's happening with income shocks, food insecurity, and also are there localized food shortages that are emerging food prices? So you know that map I showed you, we're just collecting systematic data from around the country uh, because we'd like to get ahead of, you know, if there are food shortages that are emerging, then we need localized information exactly where to, where to intervene. Right? And the other types of questions they're asking in these surveys, so in these like a 30 minute phone survey, is, you know, are, are, have, re have migrants recently returned to, uh, to the community? both international as well as internal migrants. So as soon as, uh, just like uh, Adnan Bhai described, as soon as like the lockdown was, um, was announced, uh, like in Pakistan, like in India, lots and lots of migrants left Dhaka, other urban centers and scattered all over uh, rural areas. So, uh, so that's the purpose of the surveys to get a handle on both the, how the economics as well as the public health dimensions of the crisis are evolving. And then uh, while you're making phone calls, something else you can do is that in that same phone call, you can start running some interventions that might be beneficial to uh, reduce the spread of disease, right? So you can give people good information uh, because there's now a lot of like hysteria generated on the basis of misinformation on what COVID is. Like in one district in Bangladesh, for example, there was a rumor that uh, if you cut off your hair, you're less likely to get sick. So there's a lot of strange things going on and, uh, and people are also uh, associating a lot of stigma with symptoms, which is, which is a problem because like once there's a strong stigma associated with symptoms and people hide information, then it becomes much more difficult for you to uh, address the problem. Right? And so what we're doing is in these phone calls, we also run like very quick experiments uh, based on research that I've been doing for the past few years in Malawi and Nepal that shows that if you were to give people a task of teaching others, right? And that person in their social network makes a personal appeal. Often that works better than, send, than sending a government agent from outside. Like, so we've applied this in the context of agricultural extension. So using social learning, picking important nodes in social networks to, uh, to improve uh, the dissemination of information. And so we're now applying this for health information. Okay. So, and the, and beyond the personal appeal, the other thing we started doing immediately is to build a database of community leaders in various uh, corners of the country, right? 
So by leaders, I mean, think about masjid imams at local village mosques, uh, school headmasters, right? And the government, and you know, as we started building a database, we realized that one uh, arm of the government did have some of that information. And so we've now negotiated with them, but they're worried about sharing the info because, you know, as you can imagine, imam uh, network numbers are politically fraught in Bangladesh. So we've now compromised to just get the information for 50 different sub, sub districts. And we said, look, we're going to run it there with these, for these thousand, in, thousand imams, so, so, like 1,500 headmasters. We'll make just 2,500 calls and we'll immediately collect data, which we can do over here, right? Where we're asking people about their behavior with respect to are they going to the mosque, right? On Friday, okay. prayers again. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, five minutes left. Uh, okay, sure. Sure. Thanks. Um, so what we're trying to do is, um, you know, evaluate very quickly whether this, this type of um, appeals via community leaders works, okay. and and then scale the effective strategies by by via the government's much bigger database, okay. and then um, we can use migration data and patterns. So we've gotten data on recent returnees from uh, uh, from from the Civil Aviation Authority. We have data from like all the permits that have been handed out over the last 10 years. So we use this to try and identify where the likely hotspots are, right? So we've been able to validate this and say that, look, these are the upazillas that have the, the sub-districts that have uh, lots of returnees. This is the area that you have to pay special attention to uh, because that's where the disease is likely to, likely to emerge. And then some where, you know, there's a, that's a lot of data. You do need to combine it with epidemiological models in order to say something specific about um, and the cost and benefits of suppression versus other strategies and what will happen on the economic side, right? And then finally, this is the last thing I'll talk about and then I'll, 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 I'll stop. Um, one other problem we now have is that it's clear that whatever strategy we're, we pursue, we need to provide social protection to people. You know, the Nepal graph I showed you suggests that there's huge drops in people's earning capacity and, and people are going hungry and we need to address that. Right. So the government about 72 hours ago decided that they will uh, directly uh, provide uh, provide some cash transfers, right? But unfortunately, unlike say the Aadhaar system or Jandan account in India, we don't have that infrastructure set up yet. Right? It's it's a very difficult problem to figure out how do we target the either the poor or the, whatever it is, whatever beneficiary you want to target, right? So in this case, what I'm working on with the government on and the telcos on first to identify what our targeting scheme should be. Maybe we should target the poor. Maybe we should target the people who face the largest shocks, which we can actually pick up with our, with, with our survey data. Maybe we should be targeting people who uh, expose the most others to disease risk. So for example, migrant laborers, if you can identify occupations and you know, how, how people uh, move around during the course of the year. Now, how do you target like in a, in a country with a population north of 150 million? How do you identify those people? So the strategy we're using is basically uh, a form of machine learning where with the 10,000 uh, households that I have in all my surveys, right? I, I can ground truth, you know, who's poor, what their occupation is, how, how much of a shock they're facing, et cetera, right? And so then what I can do is go to the tele telecom companies, right? And with the government's hand in it because we need to address regulatory barriers and privacy uh, issues that the government has carefully, uh, carefully thinks about and merge the survey data with the telecom data, right? To understand what are the cell phone usage patterns, top up patterns, um, data use, what type of phones do people have, right? That are predictive of the types of beneficiaries you wanna target, the poor, the, the people at risk, et cetera, right? And so once you train a model, a machine learning model to be able to match, right? You can leave, you can have a holdout sample. So let's say you have 10,000 people, 6,000 people are used to train the model. And in the other 4,000, you can test whether or not the model does a good job predicting uh, the, the deserving beneficiaries, right? And if it does do a good job, then you can, this is, the, this is like the quickest way, but then you can just allow that model, the machine learning model, and run it on the full set of 140 million cell phone uh, customers in the country and I identify beneficiaries. Of course, we're going to get inclusion errors, exclusion errors. So we're now negotiating with the government. Okay, how do we address that? Do we uh, then get, uh, you know, maybe we, the people who are identified as likely beneficiaries, we send them an SMS, they answer like three or four questions. And on that basis, we update our lists, 
right? And of course, there's a uh, there's a big um, we have to be careful about both the political dimension as well as the ethical dimension of all of this because we don't want to exclude people wrongly, right? And so there's uh, there's now negotiations ongoing as to how do we merge data based approaches like this with the traditional approaches where I don't know a district commissioner goes and taps people on the shoulder saying that these are the people who should be who should be targeted. So I'll stop there. So this uh, I just want to say that. Uh, I'll end by saying that, so as you, as you can tell, that this is a huge uh, undertaking in, in, a, in a few weeks that requires technical skills, not just from economics and social science, but from other, um, other aspects of society as well. And the, the, the silver lining in all of this is that what I've learned over the past three weeks is that there's an incredible reservoir of talent in my, uh, in my country. Uh, that hasn't been tapped well yet, and people have come together in wonderful ways to put this together. So just as an example, so I connected with a group of BWIT students, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, who started putting together all of our data and doing the right kind of visualizations, such that a government a policymaker can just click, click on Upazala, one of the sub-districts, and get good information on where the relief activities are going on, what the food security situation is there, et cetera, et cetera. And these are like young guys, computer science students, who were just fantastic at putting together websites and like it was a 72 hour turnaround. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mushfiq. Um, are there questions on Bangladesh? Um, on yeah, President? I have a couple. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, hi, Mushfiq. I'm in the economics department at Brown. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I have a couple of questions regarding the targeting of social protection um, that you mentioned, apart from the machine learning aspect of it. Uh, the Indian experience at least tells us that possibly the best way of minimizing exclusion errors is really universalization of social protection schemes. And given that the timeline at which, I mean, from what I read from the news about Bangladesh, it seems that the timeline is very dire and uh, a variety of places are facing severe food insecurity. So uh, I just wanted to understand from you uh, what your take on just universalization of emergency measures at this point would be. The second related thing that I wanted to ask is, uh, I mean, I imagine that would be a very large uh, fiscal burden um, that like at least in India, there are a couple of uh, strategies that one has started thinking of in terms of, uh, and now it seems like the fiscal deficit is really not the concern of either specialists or governments. So um, I was wondering if at all, like even if there's a targeted social protection program for emergency relief, like uh, what would be your ideas about just financing this kind of package? Okay. Um, so, I mean, Universalization question um, is both easy and incredibly difficult to answer. Um, it's easy in the sense that you know that costs money and there are trade-offs. Right? Um, and uh, there is there is something to be said for not worrying about targeting too much. Right? And in fact, if you don't want to worry about targeting too much and you don't want to worry too much about uh, uh, especially inclusion errors, meaning people getting uh, money who otherwise maybe should wouldn't wouldn't be deserving, uh, and I think that's where like when you are willing to make a lot of inclusion errors, I think that's where machine learning and training models is actually useful because you can see what type of errors you're making and you can set the 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 kind of the parameters so that you are a bit more inclusive, right? Uh, but I hear like so I've, I've also been trying to learn a lot from the experience of other countries that are a few sometimes a few years ahead of us, like in India, or a few weeks ahead of us, like in Pakistan. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's fantastic that India, you know, spent a lot of effort uh, putting together this other system, connecting it to the mobile system, et cetera, right? And that's really coming in uh, of use today. Indonesia has a much better system than we do. Now, what I learned last night from um, our colleagues in Pakistan, including Adnan, right? So I just called them up to find out what their experience has been. What I learned is that apparently uh, intuition errors cause huge political problems because that's what the newspapers pick up, you know, and people worried about corruption, right, are worried about, you know, that somebody undeserving getting it. So we have to think through the politics of that very carefully as well, right? And um, 
and 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 then the other thing I would say about universalization is that look, uh, you know, it's not we're we're not a deep pocketed country, right? and there are some people who really need to be targeted. And what we can do, like now, be building some behavioral science into this, in addition to the machine learning, right? Uh, while we cannot enforce any conditionality, we could label these transfers as conditional on like certain people staying home or if they really need to go out for their livelihoods, uh, wearing absolute necessity that it, that they wear a mask, right? And so targeting and then adding soft conditionalities to it, right? Uh, like here, we have to consult with the behavioral econo economists properly and psychologists properly. And we want to run things in such a way that people just don't think of it as, oh, everybody's getting a transfer, right? Uh, we want to run things in a way such that it has a larger marginal effect on their economic and social behaviors. Any other questions? Yeah, I, um, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting. I just, um, my name is William. I'm a first year PhD in the School of Public Health at Brown. Um, and so, I guess one of my question is mainly about your uh, the phone surveys and then kind of how that leads into the information campaigns. So I imagine there's a lot of misinformation about uh, kind of the symptoms of COVID and kind of like you said, you know, there's some rumors. Um, so I was wondering how do you kind of mitigate that within your phone surveys when you ask about symptoms um, and you ask about knowledge? Like how I guess I'm kind of a little bit more interested in like how do you tell them about COVID, but without kind of impacting the results that you're gonna get of their actual knowledge about the symptoms, while at the same time trying to get this information, which will then lead oh, okay. to that kind of information campaign? Oh, I see. Um, so the information campaign is not, is designed on the basis of consulting the WHO guidelines and consulting medical anthropologists uh, who have uh, a lot of expertise in um, in Bangladesh. We're lucky to have one of the foremost international institutions called ICDDRB, International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, one of the foremost public health institutions in the world. And uh, Steve Luby, who's at Stanford Medical School, who spent many years at ICDDRB, so he's uh, advising us on on on, on those aspects. Um, and and so the phone sir, you know, and then the other way to be careful about this is that the, the, most of the phone surveys are for data collection, right? But you're not trying to run the social influence campaign in that same phone call, right? What you're doing is you're making other phone calls in those same communities, right? To do the social influence and messaging, right? And then you can call back other people in the same community a week later to learn, okay, what do they know? Have their behaviors changed? Right? To evaluate how this worked. I have a question, um, Mushfiq. Um, I'm following up on uh, Umar's uh, question to Adnan. Uh, how has um, uh, COVID-19 um, uh, impacted uh, the congregational, religious congregations uh, in Bangladesh? It's also primarily Muslim country. Yeah. Um, and, and this is, I mean, it's not just Muslim, I mean, Hindu congregations are also huge, and we can ask uh, Sarah about Buddhist congregations, but what about uh, congregational prayers and religious congregations? Good. So this is why, you know, the, we, we, we prioritize this imam-based community leader information dissemination, right? Yeah. It's critical that we get the local imams and local level community leaders, right? And the imams have an important microphone. It's critical that we get them on board. So what the, so uh, I'll tell you what the government did and, and what we are doing to complement, right? So the government sent a central directive that no more prayers at, at, at mosques. Um, but as you, you might have seen reported in the media already, um, you know, that has had at best mixed success, right? People really do want to continue going to the mosque and there are lots of, you know, anecdotal reports of like, and, and photos, like you, you'll see a nice uh, article in Al Jazeera that's showing photos from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia about how some people are listening, but many are continuing to congregate. Okay. So I, and, and here, this is where we learn a lot from another country where I do research is Sierra Leone, and we learn a lot from the Ebola, Ebola crisis uh, and their responsiveness, and what Sierra Leone learned from that. So initially, Sierra Leone after Ebola, they sent out 
I actually had a conversation about this a few hours ago with the BBC uh, world. They wanted to know, you know, what, what is it that the rest of the development world can learn from Sierra Leone? And the answer is a lot, right? So Sierra Leone, during the Ebola crisis, they sent out military vehicles to blast out messages about the dangers of Ebola. And given the history of military intervention and civil war in that country, what people's reactions were to run away from the military rather than listen. Okay? Huh. So this time around, they they were much smarter and Sierra Leone, uh, you know, reacted to this, um, reacted to the COVID crisis in, in exemplary ways, right? So they've, from day one, they've engaged a community level messaging, okay? Uh, so to Mammy Queens, to like local councils uh, are even now innovating and coming up with these town criers who go around with boom boxes, right? And on foot spread the messages, right? And these guys are having uh, reportedly a much, much better, better effect on spreading good information. So my idea here was, I mean, given that experience, look, you can't just send central directives. If the local masjid imam is not on board, right? You're not, you're gonna have limited success, right? Because these are the guys who have to ultimately enforce. And so what we ended up doing was we came up with, a, I have to say a really beautiful script that that like pays attention, uh, pays respect as soon as we call them, right? First, we pay respect to the Huju and say like how uh, uh, how important uh, they are and how many people listen to them, etc. Right? And and we got it endorsed by the Imam Training Academy or messaging. Right? And we're also giving them small incentives, saying we're asking you to make phone calls, so can you you know let let us send you some phone credit. Uh, to get the, get them involved, uh, so we got to try this out, and we're evaluating this on a weekly basis how how well it's working, so that we can. Uh, uh, the Imam uh, Training Center is very influential, Mushfiq, right? So there, I mean, that's like the hierarchy. It's not like it's not like the Christian Church or the Pope. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but it's important that we have the endorsement because we also want our message mm -hmm. to to not be coming from New Haven. We want it to be coming from. Uh, a combination right. of behavioral science as well as the imams, as well as the government. Right. Thank you, Mushfiq.